Hello, what's up everyone? Welcome to the second part of my training course to learn Combine, Apple's framework for functional reactive programming. So I won't make the same mistake than last week and I will make sure that I am indeed live because last week I didn't check and I ended up talking uh, by myself, but no, okay. On the app, it says I'm live, so we are all good. So as I was saying, this is the second part of this training course. Last week, we saw um, the basics of Combine. I showed you all of the types that were basically, we could say the, the foundation of uh, Combine. We started then to use Combine for some real world use cases. We implemented uh, network calls. Actually, you can see the code uh, behind me. So we created an API to get movies and to search movies. And today for this second chapter, what we're going to do is that we're going to focus on what Combine calls operators. And operators, they are basically the one of the core concepts of Combine because it's all the methods that you can call on a publisher to specialize uh, how it works, to customize how it works, so to transform uh, the result of a publisher, to synchronize several publishers together, to also deal with what Combine calls back pressure, which is when values are being produced faster than they can be consumed. So we're going to see all of this. I see a few people in the chat. That's great to see that we have few people, that we have some people watching the live straight from the beginning. As always, um, I know I always say it, but if you are watching live, remember that you have access to the chat. So it's a great way to ask questions, make any remark that you might have. And whatever question or remark that you ask, you can be sure that there, is, that there are people watching the replay that will have the same. And so by writing it in the chat, not only do you get uh, a chance to get an answer, but also you are like voicing it for the people watching the replay, which is always super great. If you are watching the replay, you have two links in the description. The first one is to the GitHub repo to get access to the code that I will write during this session. And the second one is a link to Gumroad where you can buy the training course. So actually, you get the same content on YouTube. You just have a download button to download everything, the code, the videos, and you can pay whatever you want. It's like from $1, but you pay whatever you want. So it's basically more like a, a tipping jar. If you have enjoyed the training course and you want to leave me a tip, uh, you can do so on Gumroad by following the link. And um, I think that's all I wanted to say. So let's get started. So this is going to be a direct sequel to the session last week in the sense that we are really picking off uh, where we left off. So where did we left off? Let's see that. So I'm going to remind you. So I'm going to launch the app we had implemented into the simulator. So we had implemented this uh, simple app that displays a list of movies and that gets its data by querying um, an API. So let's just give a bit of time for the app to, um, to load. And so we're going to see a list of upcoming movies and we're also going to see a search bar Exactly, perfect. So you can see we are definitely in the summer of 2023 because we have both Barbie and Oppenheimer at the top of the list. And so we can scroll through this list. This list is not uh, paginated. Maybe this is what we're going to implement just after. Why not? Let's see. And um, we have the search is working. So we can search, for instance, for uh, the Godfather if you want to watch an old movie or if you want to watch... Uh, the Flash, which I saw yesterday evening. You can also select this movie. And before we move on further, we're going to keep working a bit on this um, on this um, on this uh, simple app. And first, we're going to implement a detailed view for the movie. And on this detailed view, we will be querying two pieces of information. We will be querying um, the credits of the movie, so the name of the actors and the characters that they are playing, and also the reviews that people who saw the movie uh, have left. And this way, we'll be able to synchronize these two data streams to say, or to say OK, I want to display these two data streams uh, simultaneously, simultaneously on the screen. <clears throat> All right. Uh, let me move the window a bit so that I can also see the chat. All right. Let's get started. 
So I'm going to get rid of the simulator right now because we're not going to, um, to need it. And I'm also going to put a bit of, uh, of structure inside my Xcode project. So I'm going to put um, the movies part into a folder. This way I will put the movie details into a folder of its own. And I'm going to upload to update the models. So in the models, we have the movie cast member and movie create response. I had already put them um, last week because if you remember, I had said if you want to keep uh, working, if you want some homework, you can try and implement what we're about to implement. So we already have the data model, but we hadn't implemented the network calls. So let's actually do it. And it should be fairly easy because besides the uh, URL changing, the logic for the call should be pretty similar. So let's see. I have an advantage, which is that I have the finished version on my second screen on my laptop, so I can uh, take inspiration from it. So the method will be called fetch credits. So it will fetch the credit for a given movie. So you need to pass the movie as an argument. And so we are going to return some publisher. So we are using, we are using an opaque return type and some publisher. The output is a movie uh, credits response. And then we can also have an error, so like this. And so how do we implement this, um, this method? So for the URL, I'm just going to copy and paste from the finished version because um, basically all I could do is create a typo. Uh, let me also make it a bit bigger so that you can see it. I'm going to make a bit more room something like that. So you can see URL. So we are still fetching from api.dmoviedb.org slash free slash movie. We pass in the movie ID and then we go for the credits endpoint. And of course, you need to pass in the API key. And from that, we just need to create um, a publisher that will do the network call and then parse the result. So we are going to use URL session. So what we would also use for a compression handler based um, network call or even an asynchronous yes, use async await network call. So we get the shared URL session. Then we create a data task publisher for the URL. From this, we map on the data. So we have the data and the response, but the response is more like uh, the status code, the HTTP response. We're interested in the, in the data, so the body of the response. You're saying, I think it's interesting. I don't know if it's only demo code, but force unwrapped optional make me nervous. That's a very good point because, so it's indeed a demo shortcut. And what's good to note is that this API is, um, this API call, this uh, API endpoint here, <coughs> it's dynamic because I'm using this ID field from a movie. So you're absolutely right that there is no guarantee that this will always be um, a valid a valid URL. So in a real app, you would definitely want to do um, to throw an error. Actually, you would want to throw an error. You know what? Uh, we're going to do it just after because you've raised an excellent point. So thank you for raising it and we will do it just after. So I'm mapping to get the data, which is the content of the body of the HTTP response. And then I'm going to call decode, <coughs> which is just a, a shortcut to calling decode on a decoder and then dealing with the error. But we saw last time that we could have used a uh, try map and it would have done exactly the same. So we are decoding a movie credit response and we pass in the JSON decoder, which is just a global variable. So you see it's very similar to doing a try map. Actually, the code of the try map is still visible right here. Okay. So we have implemented the method fetch credit. And so how would we deal uh, with the case of having an issue right here? What we could do is that we could say guard let so URL and else. So if the URL couldn't be constructed, we would return a publisher that returns an error. So I don't know how you do. Um, we saw that we have just when we want to have um, to uh, have a publisher, a publisher that just returns the value. But when it's an error, I don't remember. I think it's like, um, is it empty? I think it's this one, uh, empty, but it's either, I'm not sure which one it will finish, but um, you know what? So if you know 
if you can look at the documentation to find out which publisher in Combine returns an error uh, immediately. So what is the equivalent of, uh, of, oh, fail. Fail seems promising. Okay, fail, perfect, thank you. So fail, and then we just need to have an error. So let's just define an error very quickly. So uh, I will just call it my error by uh, lack of inspiration. No, let's be better on this. Let's call it networking uh, error because we are in the networking file after all. And so we could say case uh, in illegal uh, URL, for instance, might not be the best terminology to say illegal URL, but uh, at least it kind of describes what's happening. And so the error would be um, networking error dot illegal URL. And so this returns, uh, I should put in the keyword return. So this returns a publisher and a publisher that will immediately complete and complete by producing um, the error. Yeah, maybe invalid URL is, uh, is, is better. Um, actually, I guess if you want to find the real, the correct name, you would need to look at like uh, the, the RFC for like uh, URLs. Maybe there is a very specific name because when you pass in a string that doesn't parse as a URL, that's the, that's the actually what's happening. Like it doesn't parse as a, as a URL. So yes, I guess invalid URL is a, is a good way to, to put it. Okay, and here it's an API. Why it says um, function declares an opaque return type some publisher, but the return statement in its body. Ah yes, very interesting. If you've done some uh, some Swift UI, you might remember the kind of error that you get when you do an if inside uh, um, uh, a function that returns uh, some view and you don't use uh, what's it called? Um, what is it called? Um, um, add view builder. So it's because some publisher, it's an opaque return type, and opaque means that we don't have to explicitly write it out, but the compiler need, needs to be able to determine the type at compile time. And I insist on the use of uh, the article D, the type because it must be a single type that is returned for all possible code paths. So here, what we should do would be to use the erase to any publisher. And then the error should go away because now we are always returning an any publisher, which uh, conforms to publisher. So that's interesting because we also get to see this case where erase to any publisher is still useful even though we are using an opaque return type. So thanks a lot, David, for this, uh, for this remark, because as you can see, uh, it, led, it led us to uh, something even more interesting. So we have the first uh, API call to fetch the credits. Now we're going to do the one to fetch the reviews. Uh, if you're watching um, the replay, now would be a good time to hit pause and try to implement it by yourself. And it's fairly easy. You just need to find out the URL of the endpoint, but uh, doing it by yourself would be, um, would be uh, something that I would recommend. Me, I will just copy paste. This way, we can uh, we can move along. And so it's going to be called uh, fetch reviews like this. So this time I have a movie reviews response. And so what will change is the endpoint. I'm no longer calling for credits, but for reviews. The rest stays uh, the same. Just need to, of course, here change the type. And I have uh, implemented. My, uh, my two new network calls. You can see they were extremely similar to the, the previous ones. So nothing that uh, much new up until, up until now, but now we will start to go into the, the new things because we are going to synchronize the call to these two. Uh, we're going to synchronize the publishers returned by these two network calls. So I'm going to create a new group, which I will call movie detail, uh, detail or details, details. So this way I will put it at the same level than my movie group. Okay. And I'm going to create a movie details view model. 
So I'm following the same logic than before. And since I'm going to display this into a Swift UI view, having a view model will make total sense. So I'm going to import combine so that I have access to all of the combine types into this view model. And so I will create my class movie details view model. I'm going to make it conform to observable object because I want to use it on Swift UI and I am still on iOS 16. So I don't have access to the new observation framework. And so why do I need for movie details view model? We saw that to call the methods fetch credits and fetch reviews, we need to have a movie. So the movie details view model will need to have a movie. You can see I'm making it as a let constant because this won't change. The movie will be passed when the view model is created and then it will not change for the lifetime of the view model. So of course I need to provide the view model with an init because it's a class, not, uh, not a struct. So there is no free init synthesized by default. So you can see I'm just implemented a member wise initializer. We are also going to need a way um, to store um, to store the um, to store the, um, the subscriptions. So for this, I'm going to have my private var cancelables, which is going to be a set of any cancelable. Remember, any cancelable is what you get once you have done a sync, once you have listened to the result of a publisher, you are being returned with a cancelable and you store it somewhere. And when the any cancelable is deallocated, your subscription is canceled. And so last week in the previous session, we saw that any cancelable was a way to tie the lifetime of a, of a combined subscription to the lifetime of an already existing object. So here we're going to use this to tie the lifetime of the subscription we create inside the view model to the lifetime of the view model, which makes total sense. Okay. Uh, now let's start and implement the method fetch data and uh, we'll see what we need uh, along the way. Of course, we will need an add publish property at some point because we will need to trigger updates of the, uh, of the UI. So let's see. Uh, first, we start by calling fetch credits. We fetch credits for the movie. Okay. Um, we're going to map on the results because we have a movie credits response, but we're only interested in the array of cast members. And for now, we are going to store this into a local uh, constant. So I'm going to call it credits publisher like that. And as you can imagine, I'm going to do the same for the reviews. So reviews publisher and it's going to be fetch uh, reviews for movie. What's amazing is that credits and reviews take the same uh, amount of letters. So the code looks uh, super tidy. That's pretty amazing. Of course, now it stops because on the one hand, we have cast, on the other hand, we have results. Okay, so let's go there. And now what I want to do is that I want to synchronize uh, these two data streams because I want to display data on the, on the screen only when both, only once both publishers have yield, uh, yield or yielded? have yield, I'm, I'm going to go with yield, have yield their, um, their result. So once I have the credits and once I have the reviews, then I will display data on the screen. It might not be what you would like to do in a real app. You would probably want to have each uh, part of the UI load independently and display data as soon as it is available. But here I'm doing it that way on purpose because I want to show you a simple case of how you synchronize more than one data stream in Combine. So if you've ever done uh, Eric Swift, or if you remember, because I think I mentioned it last week, when you want to synchronize two data streams and you want to get uh, their results together, you use an operation that is called zip. So how do you access zip? Remember last time we saw that there is this enum publishers, which is essentially, uh, not essentially, it's what it is. It does only that. It is a namespace inside which we have several operators being defined and we have this operator zip. So you can see we have several zip. We have zip, zip3 and zip4. It's because each of them works for two, three or four uh, data streams. 
Uh, if you have more than four data streams to synchronize, maybe it's a sign that you should refactor your code uh, before, but you could also always like do it by doing a zip on the first two and then uh, doing uh, the zip like uh, recursively. So here I'm just going to use a normal zip. It's actually very similar, you know, that in Swift you have a zip which takes two sequences and uh, puts them together. So you get the first element of the first sequence along with the first element of the second sequence, then the two second elements, the two third elements, etc. And so this zip does actually the same thing. So I want to zip my credit publisher with my reviews publisher. And then what am I going to do? First, I'm going to say I want to receive on the main dispatch queue because I'm going to want to update the UI um, when I get the new data. Then I'm going to want to, um, to map. So what do I get by default? By default, I get a tuple with uh, elements of the first publisher and elements of the second publisher. But you can see the name of the, um, of the tuples, the items, the elements of the tuple have uh, anonymous names, so dot zero, dot one. That's not great at all in terms of clarity. So I will still use a tuple, but I will use a named tuple. So I want to uh, give the name credits to uh, the first element of the tuple and reviews to the second element of the tuple. Um, I could have also used a struct uh, at that point using a struct or, um, or a tuple. Uh, it's, basically the, it's basically the same. I just wanted to show you a, a use case for using a tuple. Okay, and now I need to do something with this tuple. So we need to assign it to something. So that's when I'm going to introduce my at published property. So I will call it uh, data for lack of the uh, lack of a better term. And it's going to be a tuple that will have both uh, the credits, which is an array of movie cast member like that, and also the reviews, which are an array of movie review like this. So here I have my type, and of course I need to give it an initial value. It will be a tuple with two empty arrays, like that. And so now I can use, I cannot use assign, uh, assign on. So once again, if you are watching the, the replay, maybe uh, pause it and try to understand why I cannot use assign on to assign the results um, of the two publishers zip together to my property right here. We saw the reason why uh, in, the, in the first session. So I'm gonna give you the answer, and it's because for now we haven't dealt with the potential errors. And so uh, you can only use assign on when the error is of type never, meaning when the publisher cannot produce an error. So we could either use a, a catch, I think, in order to deal with the uh, error, or we can do also replace error with, uh, and replace error with just an empty array. And so now I can use assign to, and so I'm gonna do assign to data like this. You can notice I don't need to use uh, my set of unique cancelable, actually, because since I'm assigning to the publisher of this, uh, to, the, to, the publish, to the underlying publisher of this property, uh, basically, when the property will be deallocated, the publisher will be also deallocated. So that's why I don't need to use uh, a cancelable in that case. The other approach I could have taken would have been to use sync. And so on sync, I will get my new data. And what I would have done is uh, a weak self, and then I would have done self dot data equal data, and then store in cancelables. Uh, both syntaxes are similar. Uh, I would even dare to say that they are uh, equivalent. Um, so you can use whichever you uh, you prefer. Uh, personally, I would prefer using uh, that one. And so I'm just going to, to comment out the cancelable to make it obvious that uh, you don't need it for the code to work. So we are almost there. And uh, that's it, actually. We have implemented the synchronization of the two publishers. 
So that's pretty cool. Now we just need to see it in action. So I'm going to have to create my movie details view. So remember to create a Swift UI view. This way you will have the preview already created for you. And so here I'm just going to do um, a good old uh, copy and paste. Uh, at least for the body, because I don't want to type everything by hand. But first, let's just uh, deal with the view model. So of course, we're going to store a view model, which will be a movie details view model. And when we want to init the movie details view, we want to init it with a movie like this. And so now the question is, how do we create the view model? Because the view model is going to be a state object and we can't I mean if we try to um, if we try to instantiate it here we don't have access to the movie so that's a problem and so the little trick here which I might have shown in my Swift UI training already is that you can access the underlying state object um, state object um, not property, but a variable. That's the underlying variable that stores the state object. And so you can, inside of it, create a, a, st a state object and assign it. And so I will do it like this. So it's not, um, it's not the, the best um, code you can write, but as far as I know, that's the only solution I know to be able to give an initial value to a state object when you cannot initialize it uh, in line. So when you cannot give it a default value um, on the same line, then you've done the, the declaration. So with underscore, you access the underlying variable that stores the object of type state, ob state object. And so you are basically manually creating your state object. Since we're doing it in the unit, in the init, I would say it's okay. But of course, you wouldn't want to be doing this uh, in the middle of uh, of the life cycle of, uh, of your view because you would be breaking some invariants that SwiftUI probably relies on. So of course, now we need to provide a movie in the preview, otherwise the preview won't be, uh, won't be working. So here, I'm just going to copy paste a working uh, preview. So as you can see, I'm just storing a movie inside the... Um, uh, I'm just storing a movie inside um, a, static, uh, a static constant. Um, you can notice that I could have just passed in a movie ID. I chose to pass in a movie this way. We have a better like typing because movie ID here in the code is just an int. And so just passing an int, uh, you lose a bit in terms of, uh, of semantics. So passing a movie, I would say it's better. You could, of course, uh, refactor the code so that the type of the ID reflects the fact that it's the ID of a movie. But that's a bit, more, uh, a bit more code. And just by passing a movie, you preserve a lot of, uh, of type safety, I would say. And so now you just need to implement the, the body. So that's where uh, I'm sorry, but I'm just going to copy and paste a big chunk of code because you don't want me to spend time writing this by hand. But as you can see, I create a list. In the list, I put two sections, the credits and the reviews. And inside each of these sections is the same logic. I do a for each to iterate either over the credits stored in the view model or the reviews. And then for each credit or review, I create a vStack where I have either the name of the actor and the name of the character or the name of the author of the review and the, the text, the content of the review. I have a navigation title that is set to the title of the movie. And finally, one thing I must not forget to do is inside my on app here to call the method fetch data on the view model. So we are almost there. We actually need just one last thing. Uh, we need to go back into the movie and add uh, a navigation link. So I won't use navigation stack. I'm going to do it uh, old style because it's the, it's the easiest. So what I will do is that I will create my navigation link. So inside the list, I will do it with this init destination and label. So the label is easy. It's just my h tag, which I will simply cut and paste at the right place, all right? And so the destination will be movie uh, details view. 
and I can pass in the movie because I have access to it. Okay, it seems it's pretty good. Um, you know what? Let me run this code in the simulator and uh, let's see what's going to happen. So we can see navigation link is indeed here because we have the little disclosure indicator. So let's see if we go with Barbie, we can see uh, we can see the cast. So you can see a lot of people being called Barbie, but that's normal. If you watch the movie, you will understand why. And if we scroll a bit, do we have the reviews? Yes, we have the reviews. And so you can see that both streams of data have been synchronized because the view was only populated once I had uh, both the cast and the reviews together. And so you can try it with a few other movies. You can look for Oppenheimer, for instance, and you will have also the cast and then the reviews. So that's it. We have implemented uh, first logic to synchronize two, um, two data streams, and we did it by using the operator zip. So this was uh, a nice way for me to ease into this topic of operators, which is going to be like the focus of this session. And so now let's keep moving and let's keep discovering more operators. So I'm going to, keep, to quit this, uh, no, I don't want to actually close the project. I'm going to leave it open because I might need to refer to it uh, in a few minutes, but I will create a new project. Let me put it where you can see it. So I will call it um, operators, you know what? Operators, so still a Swift UI and a Swift project. I'm going to just put it on my desktop. Okay, perfect. Let me hide uh, this and let me on my second screen open uh, the finished project so that I can look at it and make sure I'm not telling you any mistake. All right. So we're going to do the same thing than we did last time. Uh, we're going to create a Swift file, which we're going to call code. Inside of it, we declare a top level function called run and then on the content view in the app, so in the in the Swift UI app, we are going to add an to add an on appear modifier, and we're going to call the function run inside of it. This way, we can just write code here, and it will be run whenever we launch the app into the simulator. Okay, let me just I'm noticing that yes, you wouldn't have seen the bottom of the Xcode window. Okay, now we're good. So let's start and see a few operators. But before we see a few operators, we need to have um, a few publishers. So I'm going to create two publishers we're going to use uh, throughout our discovery of operators. So the first, which I will call even integers publisher, and it's a publisher that will publish even integers. So two, four, uh, eight, and 10. You can notice I have skipped six uh, on purpose because I want to have a different uh, number of items between even integers publisher and its cousin, which I'm going to call odd integers publisher. And so this one is going to have one, three, five, seven, and nine. So it has one more uh, item. All right, let me put it like this. And so let's start and discover um, a few operators. So we already saw zip, so we won't see it again that fast, but we will see um, an operator that is kind of similar to zip in many aspects, which is called combine latest. So how does combine latest work? So you access it by accessing the namespace publishers. And of course, for this, you need to do what I've forgotten to do, which is to import combine. So publishers dot combine latest. Just like zip, you can see we have combine latest, combine latest free, and combine latest four. I'm just going to do combine latest free for now. And so pass in both, um, both publishers here as its arguments. I'm going to format the code so that it takes a little bit less um, real estate on the screen. 
Okay, I realized I forgot to do one thing, which is to turn my array, uh, my arrays into publishers. Now that's done, the mistake has been uh, fixed. Okay, um, and so let's try and see what's gonna happen if I sync on this combine latest. So when I receive a value, I will receive two things. I will receive an even and an odd integer. So I'm getting them right here using the tuple destructuring syntax. And I'm just gonna print. I will say, all right, latest even is the even number I've received and latest odd is the odd number I've received. Okay, uh, we need to store this into an, uh, a set of any cancelable. Uh, so what's wrong with six? Nothing, but on purpose, I want to have a different number of items into the two, uh, into the two publishers. I want the two publishers to emit a different number of, uh, of values because it allows us to see some interesting, uh, not even edge cases because it's not that, uh, that much of an edge case, edge case but uh, it allows us to see some interesting uh, things happening. So here I'm going to have my cancelables, so set of any cancelable like that. This way I can store it like this. Okay, let's run the code, let's see what happens, and then let's try and make sense from it. So running our little app in the simulator, I'm putting the simulator out of view because um, there's nothing interesting uh, on it. And you can see we see latest even 10, latest odd 1, latest even 10, latest odd 3, latest even 10, latest odd 5, and then same thing, the latest even is always 10, and the latest odds, they are progressing. So why is this happening? Um, this might seem weird, but actually it highlights a behavior of combined latest that is very important to take into account which is that combine latest, as its name suggests, will combine the latest value emitted by the set of publishers we give it as its argument. But in order to have a latest value, you need to have a value. And so in order for combine latest to publish a tuple, you need each of its input publisher to have also published uh, to have also emitted a value. So I say that to, to mean that imagine that you are putting uh, three publishers through a combined latest. Two of these publishers are publishing lots of values, but the third one never publishes a single value. Then your combined latest will never publish a single value. And what we see happening here is actually a consequence of this behavior, because since I have my publishers here, they are a bit weird because they are publishing all their values uh, at once. They are actually synchronous publishers. So the even integer publisher is going to produce all of its values immediately, 2, 4, 8, and 10. And so the odd integer publisher doesn't, doesn't even have time to publish anything. So it, it still hasn't published anything. And by the time the odd integer publisher starts publishing its first value, the even integer publisher has already published all of its values. And so at that point, the latest value from this publisher is the last one is 10. And so that's why we get this result that seems weird. But actually, once you know how combined latest works, uh, actually makes total sense. And to show you that what I was saying about um, what would happen if uh, one of the publishers didn't emit anything, we can do this time combine latest free and add a third publisher, which will be an empty publisher, so a publisher that never publishes anything. And this time, so I think I need to make it, I need to give it a, a type, something like that. I think I need to type it. And here, of course, I need to add a new argument. Okay. This time it has built. As you can see, the app has launched, but uh, nothing gets printed to the console because this third publisher never publishes anything. And so even though the two others have published tons of values or tons, 
the first one has published uh, has published four, and the second one has published five. Uh, nothing um, nothing gets outputted. So it's something to really have in mind because when you try to describe combine latest and zip, sometimes a description that you can make is that a zip is kind of like a, a, a end, the end operator. So a and D um, for publishers because it synchronizes them together. I need to have a value on each of the publishers to go forward. And we tend to say that combined latest is kind of like or because all it takes is one publisher to emit uh, for a new event to be uh, emitted. But that's only true once all of the publishers have emitted uh, a first value. So you want to be careful about it because it's very easy to get um, to get caught. Uh, like imagine, for instance, you are using combined latest to uh, check that the form is uh, is valid. And so for that, each of the field in your form is going to emit a Boolean to say whether the value it's holding right now is uh, is valid. But maybe you have some forms that are optional and that the user might not uh, fill in. And if the user doesn't fill that field, then the is valid of that field might never emit a value. And then the combine later that is supposed to unlock the submit button at the end of the form uh, might never be turned on. So uh, combine latest can be uh, can be really tricky. Uh, a good way to deal with it would be, for instance, to make each publisher return optional values and then send in a nil value or a default value as its uh, as its first value. That's also a way that you can uh, you can deal with it. Um, and I think that's all I wanted to tell you about uh, combine latest. First, that it exists. Uh, then what it does, it combines the latest elements emitted by a set of publishers. But be careful with this uh, very tricky caveat, caveat, which is that all the publishers need to have emitted at least one uh, one event. Otherwise, one uh, one output. Otherwise, it doesn't work. At least, combine latest won't emit anything. It might be what you want. It might not be what you want. But this is how it's going to um, to behave. Um, so once you've seen combine latest, the next logical operator to see is zip. So let's try and see zip this time how it's going to behave with our. Um, with our two um, two publishers, so I'm just going to comment out this code so that the console stays uh, stays rather clean. So we're going to say publishers dot zip. Okay, we pass in uh, the even integer publisher and the odd integers publisher. Let me format the code nicely. I'm so looking forward to the the shortcut in Xcode 15 that will do it that will do this uh, this uh, little like formatting uh, automatically. Um, okay, then what do we want to do about the result of the zip? Uh, we're just going to do the same thing than above. So we're going to sync over the um, the the tuple that we that we get, and so we're going to print. We're going to say zip, and so the even value is the one we receive and the odd value is also the one that we receive. Let's store this into the cancellables and let's run this code and let's see what will get printed to the console. And as you can see, this time we have a different behavior because zip, it waits for events to have been emitted. So what it's going to do is that zip is going to wait for the two publishers to emit their first event, and then it will emit a tuple with the two values. Then it will wait for the publishers to emit their second values, and it will emit a new tuple with the two second values, etc. And you can see that we get different results than with combined latest. With combined latest, we would always have the last value of the first publisher because it would have emitted all of its values before the second publisher had the chance to emit uh, a value. But this time it's not the same thing because even though even integers publisher still has emitted all of its value, still has published all of its values uh, before all integers publisher had the time to even, um, even publish its first value, zip is still keeping the values and will only publish them once there is a value on the same index uh, for the second publisher. So we get 
Q and 1, 4 and 3, uh, 8 and 5, 10 and 7. And you can see that nev na uh, not nev not never nine <laughs> nine is never published because there is no fifth value on uh, the other publisher and so in that case zip will not emit uh, anything it will wait if there were to be uh, another value on uh, on the um, on the first publisher, then it would emit it along with uh, with this nine. And of course, if one of the publishers were to uh, to complete, then zip would also complete. Same thing if there were uh, an error. So this is how zip works. So zip it really works when you want to uh, to have uh, something happen once a set of publishers have all emitted um, a value. So I think I've showed you a typical example, which is like when you have several events happening and then you need to have all of the results of these events to go uh, to go forward. So it could happen, for instance, you want to save data, like you have several data to save, to, to, to write to several files and you want to wait for all of the write uh, to have finished before you, uh, you move on. Or you need to make um, several network calls uh, when you are starting your uh, your app and you want to synchronize them uh, all together uh, because you only want to actually display the first screen of your app once all of these network calls have finished uh, returning. For instance, these are great examples of when you would want to use uh, to use Zip. And so Zip and Combine Latest they are two of the most like. Um, not popular, but uh, common uh, operators in uh, in combine. Um, I didn't, uh, at least operators, when you want to combine several streams together. I didn't do that much combine in production, but I did a lot of Eric Swift in production and uh, combine latest and zip were definitely um, among the, the most um, common operators uh, I would use to synchronize uh, to synchronize data streams. Um, there is a third operator that is kind of similar to zip and uh, and combine latest. So you know what? Let me actually uncomment this code. Let me just remove this right here. Okay, like that. Perfect. And so there is another operator on publishers that is called merge. Merge is um, a bit different. Um, you can see that there are more uh, overloads. You can go up to eight. And you even have merge many, which takes uh, an unknown number of um, an unknown number of um, of publishers. And the reason why we have this possibility is because you can only merge publishers that returns uh, that have outputs of the same uh, type. So here, for instance, we can merge even integers publisher and odd integers publisher because they both have the same output type, which is int. And so what's going to happen if I uh, sync? So I'm going to do my sync. So I will have, uh, I will receive a number as an argument. And so I'm just, actually it's going to be an integer. So I can just write here uh, integer. And so I'm going to print. I will say, okay, merge. And uh, this is what we have. This is what merge has yield or yielded. I'm still not sure which one is uh, is correct. I do my store in cancelables and let's see what's going to happen. Uh, build failed. Oh yes, I forgot to remove the extra argument right here. So you can see merge, as the name suggests, it merges. Okay, so it's yielded. Thanks for, uh, thanks for checking. So merge is going to merge uh, the two Publishers together in the sense that um, you will, you will, we, we will get, and you also will get, so we will both get a new publisher that will simply emit um, the, uh, basically every time one of the underlying publishers emits a new value, the result publisher will also emit it. Basically, so it's a, it's a, it's a merge. Instead of getting a tuple, we get only one value. And so that's why the publishers need to have the same type for their output because everything is going to go through the same uh, uh, the same argument, which here is integer. And so this uh, there need to be a common type uh, a common type that um, 
that allows you to refer to the output of both uh, publishers. And so here we have first all the values of the first publisher and then all the values of the second publisher. And that's, um, that's because the first publisher emits its values first. But we could try, for instance, to do a delay. So I'm going to delay for one second on the main, uh, on the main scheduler. And you can see this time it's different. First, it's the odd integers that publish their value, and then the even integers. So merge is a little bit um, less common, because since you need to have the same type, it's a little bit less of a common situation. But it can be useful whenever you have data coming in from several like uh, data source, and you don't care about um, which data source has uh, produced the data, you just want to deal with it. In that case, you can merge uh, your data streams and, uh, and deal with the events uh, as they come. So I haven't used it um, that much, but it's, uh, it's good to know, um, to know about it. In a way, it's kind of like, so here it kind of looks like a concatenation because each, pu each publisher has uh, published its values all at once, but it's not a concatenation. It's really like merging. So the values uh, will be like uh, intertwined uh, if, First publisher, first publishes, then second, then first, then second. Then all of the values will be uh, will be intertwined. Here we have all of the values of the first publisher, then all the values of the second. But it's because we are dealing with the special case of publishers that yield uh, all of their values uh, at once. Okay, now we're going to go into um, into a bit more uh, some more advanced operators and some more advanced concepts. So I'm going to create a new publisher, which I will call random uh, numbers publisher. And I'm going to create it from a timer. So a timer that will publish every second. It will do it on the main run loop and in the default mode. So this is basically a timer that will, uh, this creates a publisher that will trigger, uh, that will output an event every second. I need to use auto connect so that it automatically starts sending uh, sending values. That's a, a special case for this uh, this kind of uh, what's combined calls what combined calls connectable publishers. And then I'm gonna map on the event which I don't care uh, about. It's just like um, the fact that it's a timer event. And what I want to do is to do int random in zero up to but not including one hundred. So what this code does is that every second it's going to um, it's going to create uh, this publisher every second is going to output a random integer between zero and nine and ninety nine. So let's try and uh, and use it now. So I'm gonna use my random numbers publisher. I'm gonna sync on it and I'm gonna say okay I get a random uh, value and I want to print it to the console. So I'm going to print random value. So like this, okay, I print my random value. So first we're gonna make sure that, uh, that it works. So I'm going to run the code just to see our nice little random values appear in the console. You can see 68, 58, 42, 67, 60, 42. So it seems to be working perfectly. And then I'm going to duplicate this code. And so I'm going to say I get random value A and I get random value B. And as you can imagine, the question I'm going to want to ask is, will the values in A and B be the same? Meaning, will, um, will both uh, sync operators share the same publisher? Will it be the same publisher that outputs its value to these two sync operators? Or will these two sync operators trigger the creation of separate publisher? So let's see what's going to happen. And as you can see, we get different values. And that's something that's, um, that's actually important to have in mind, which is that by default, when you subscribe to a publisher, it's going to create um, it's going to create a data stream, but every subscription will create a different data stream. 
So here, I don't really have a random publisher, but rather I have the recipe to create a random publisher. And then when I use sync, it's going to use that recipe to create the random publisher, but it will create two separate random publisher. And we have the evidence here because we are getting different random values. So this is the behavior by default, and most of the time this is what you want. But there could be cases where you don't want this, and actually you want both subscriptions to share the same publisher, and so you need a mechanism to opt out of this creation of a new publisher for every subscription. And the way to do it is to call the operator share, which shares the output of an upstream publisher with multiple subscribers. So I've called share, and you can see that now we always get the same random value. So if we had gotten the same random value once, we could have said, okay, it's just luck, but uh, every time, that many times, uh, it's no longer luck. It could be, but the, the odds are like really, really, really low. And so it's because now, thanks to the use of the operator share, now we actually have our two subscription sharing the same publisher. And so that's why now the random number that is received by both calls to the sync operator are now the same. So it's something that's interesting to have in mind, especially if you have a publisher that does something costly and that is being listened to uh, in several parts uh, of your app or even of, uh, of a view. You could imagine, I don't know, like a publisher, for instance, that uh, downloads um, a big piece of data from um, a network call or that, or that loads it from that loads it from the from the disk. Um, let's imagine, for instance, yeah, you're loading a big file from the from the disk. Uh, if you are listening to the content of that file in several places, you probably don't want to load the file for every place that you are listening to the the result. You want to load it only once and then stream the result to the different observers. And in that case, you need to remember to use um, to use the share uh, operator for this. Let's see if we have something else. Oh, yes. Then we need to see another operator that is uh, very useful, which is how can we turn um, a function that uses a compression, a compression handler into a, a publisher. That's something quite useful because if you need to encapsulate legacy code into a, into a, a combined data stream, you will need to use this. And so you're saying the fact that Sync creates a publisher is surprising behavior to me. Um, I agree that it has the potential to be surprising. I don't remember if um, if Eric Swift has this behavior or, or not. Uh, I'm not sure. Like uh, I think it depends on the kind of uh, of type that you use. Some of them share by default and not all of them. But uh, I agree that it can indeed be um, be surprising, and it can really be the kind of thing where like uh, you. For a very long time, you were not aware of it and it was not a problem. And then one day you get a very weird bug in production. And then you, uh, you, learn, uh, you learn that fact that uh, it creates a new publisher every time, but you learn it like uh, you learn the, the hard way, basically. So let's see. Let's keep moving. So let's imagine that we have um, a function. So I'm going to create it here. Uh, I'm going to call it like uh, legacy async stuff like this. And this function takes a completion handler to return its result. So the result will be an integer. This way it will be compatible with the rest of our code. And so inside, I'm just going to do a dispatch queue main um, async after. Um, this way, like uh, we have something that is really like uh, asynchronous. OK, and we call the compression handler, and we pass in a value. And you can see I'm passing in a random value. So maybe I'm going to want to check also like uh, how this behaves when there is more than one subscriber. Maybe it will be the same behavior by default. Maybe not. But first, let's see how we can uh, wrap this into, um, into the combined world. So for this, we're going to use a type that's called future. So future, as you can see, it takes as an argument a closure, attempt to fulfill, and it takes uh, this closure takes a promise as its argument. 
And so the promise is something that you can call with a result, so either success or failure. And so inside the closure you pass to future, you would call your async, uh, your legacy async stuff. You would have the compression handler you pass into legacy async stuff. So there would be um, a number that you would get as a result. And so you would call the promise and here say, okay, this is a success and I'm passing my number as the output. So if you've used uh, Swift concurrency and you've used the function with checked continuation, this might remind you of something because the logic is, uh, is, um, is fairly the same. Here, um, I think I just need to let the code know which is the type of the error. So I will say here it can never fail. And so the type of the error is never. So future is a publisher. So it takes two types, output and, um, and failure. And so now we can use this, um, this publisher. So I'm going to store it into a local constant. So I'm going to call it legacy async stuff publisher, like that. And so let's try and listen to it. So I'm going to... Um, oh, publisher, because I was not calling the right thing. So I'm going to take this. I'm going to sync on it. And so I will get uh, my number and I will say, okay, I'm going to print it and I will say legacy uh, async, async stuff result and I'm going to pass in my number and store it, of course, in the cancelables. Okay. Uh, you know what? Let me just comment the two random things, because otherwise the console is going to be a mess. And we can look at the results. And so what can we see? Um, we can see legacy async stuff result 11. So first it shows that uh, what I have written works. We were indeed able to wrap this completion handler based uh, function into a combined publisher by using the future publisher. And now the question I want to ask is, what happens if I listen to it a second time? So legacy async stuff result A and legacy async stuff result B. Let's see what's going to happen. We need to wait for three seconds. And you can see we have the same result. It could be pure chance. There is what? Like, uh, what are the odds of having the, the same, uh, the same, uh, the same number? I think it's like, uh, I think it's one over, like, yeah, it's like one over a hundred. So like, uh, let's run it a second time, you know, maybe we are just like very lucky. So let's see what's going to happen. We still get the same number. Let's run it a third time just to make sure. Okay. We still get the same number. And so the reason why we get this is that. I told you that um, publisher, by default, uh, when you sync to them, when you subscribe to them, it creates a new publisher. But every rule has its exception. And future is the exception. By default, the result of a future is cached. And so that's why the, first, the second time I listen to it, I get the same result because the, the result of the future has been cached. So it can be great when it makes sense to cache it. For instance, if you're making an HTTP call and uh, you don't want to keep making the call um, if you request the same value in several places. So that can be great in this, uh, in this case, but it might not always be what you want. And of course, there is a mechanism to uh, force uh, your code to force your code to have um, to force your code to uh, replay the closure inside the future every time, and this mechanism is called deferred. So if you look actually at um, combined tutorials or blog articles, sometimes you will see deferred being used with future as a default, and it kind of uh, it kind of makes sense. And so let's see how default works, how deferred works. So deferred takes a closure called create publisher. And this closure will be called every time you subscribe to um, the deferred. So in a way, deferred, you can kind of see it as like a lazy publisher in the sense that it's going to call a closure every time 
to um, to create uh, to create the publisher. And so here, there is a, there is actually another catch that I want to show you. So let's imagine that I do legacy async stuff publisher. So I've put my publisher inside my deferred. My deferred expects uh, expects a closure at return the publisher. This is the publisher, okay? I need to store uh, the result of defer somewhere, so I'm going to put it in this thing. So legacy, I'm gonna call it legacy async stuff deferred publisher. And now let's try and listen to it. Let's see what's gonna happen. We can see we're still getting the same result. That's very weird, but it could just be chance. So let me just run it a second time. Okay, so there is indeed something wrong. And this is so tricky that when I was preparing the content, it took me like a few minutes to understand what's happening. But the problem is that what I've done here is that I have created a publisher and put it into um, a variable. So my publisher, my future, it's a class, so it's an instance. And what I'm saying here with my deferred, just um, wait. Yes, here I'm saying, okay, when you subscribe, you just return the instance, but the instance has already been created. It's already been stored somewhere. So actually I'm not creating a new future every time. I'm just returning the existing future every time. So my deferred here actually does absolutely nothing. And so what I need to do is to actually move uh, the whole future inside the deferred. Alternatively, instead, I could just here, uh, you know, wrap everything inside a closure and then call the closure inside the deferred. But here, there is no need uh, for this. I can just like uh, copy and paste the code. And so now, with this change, whenever deferred will be called, it will create a new future. And so we will get a different random number. So let's actually try it. Remember, there is still one chance in a hundred where it doesn't give the result that seems to make sense, but okay. We were lucky. We were in the 19, uh, nine, 99 other possible cases where we got a different value because now, thanks to us using defer the right way, whenever we subscribe to uh, the publisher, the closure passed to deferred is called, and so this closure creates a new future every time. So remember to wrap a completion handler or even uh, also a delegate, um, a delegate uh, into, um, into the combined world, you, you would use uh, a future, but you want to be careful because future caches its results by default. And so if you want to create a new future every time, then you definitely want to use deferred. This could be especially problematic if uh, the call inside your future is going to make an upload, for instance, because then you might end up in a situation where you make the upload the first time and then you try to make the upload with new data, but uh, nothing happens because you're still using the same future. And that's why when you look at uh, code samples, sometimes, at least I remember that I've seen a lot of time, future being used with, uh, with deferred um, as, a, as the, default, uh, the default approach. But I really wanted to show you where, uh, where the difference lies between the two. All right. Um, what have we seen up until now? We've seen quite a few things, but we are not done uh, yet because I showed you um, I showed you how to encapsulate either a method that has a compression handler or a delegate that returns only one value to take this from the compression handler or delegate world into the combined world. But how can you do it when you have something that is going to yield more than one value? So that's what we're going to see uh, now. So first, I need to declare a new function, so I will call it a uh, repeated legacy async stuff. So this time, this will take a handler, but I won't call it a completion handler because this handler will be called several times and it's still going to yield values of type um, integer. And so this time I'm going to say, okay, for e 
for i in uh, 1 to 10, so I want to repeat this 10 times, I'm going to say dispatch queue main async um, after. So I'm going to say a deadline is going to be now plus 3 times i as a double. So what I want to do is to emit values. So one after three seconds, one after six seconds, one after nine seconds, etc. This way we will see like the, the values appear in the in the con in the console. And so I'm gonna call the handler and I will say okay int dot random and so I just want to return um, a random value something like that. And so how can I um, wrap this into the combined world, we're going to use something called a subject. And so there are two subjects in, uh, in combine. You have pass through subject and current value subject. But let's have a look at the protocol subject. You can see it's similar to a publisher because actually it implements the protocol publisher. But you have methods to send uh, things. You can send a new value. You can send a completion. And you will be able to call these methods to send a value programmatically. So you have similar things in, um, in Eric Swift. It's similar to uh, things like behavior, relay, uh, that kind of thing. And so I was telling you, you have two subjects, pass through subject, which, on which you will be able to send the value and it will be um, propagated downstream to uh, the, its observers and current value subject, which does the same thing, but also gives you access to the current value. And uh, this one definitely has, uh, has an equivalent in, uh, in Eric Swift. And I think this is behavior relay, it's, uh, it's equivalent. So let's uh, try and use this. So we won't be able to use it uh, just like that. We will need to wrap it into a, a wrapper. So I'm going to create a class that I'm going to call wrapper. This class is going to have uh, a subject. So I'm going to make it a pass through subject that will uh, pass through integers and that will never have to deal with errors. Then I'm going to have also a publisher. So it's going to be some publisher of integer and never. So I need to have, of course, compatible types between the types of the publisher and the type the types of the, the pass through subject. Um, what will it be? Uh, the publisher will just be my subject and then erase to any publisher. So basically, the subject is private because I want to be able to send new values only inside the wrapper, but I still want uh, the world outside the wrapper to be able to observe the values. And so for this, I expose a publisher, which is my subject erased to any publisher. And finally, in the init of the class, I'm going to call my method repeated, repeated legacy async stuff. And so I will be getting numbers. And what I'm going to do is that I'm going to capture my subject. This way I don't have to, I could have done a, a weak self. Actually, I will show you like both syntaxes. So I can do a weak self and then do self question mark subject send the number, first syntax. It's important to do weak self because otherwise uh, you would get uh, you would get like a retain cycle uh, as long as uh, this, uh, this closure is in memory. But the other approach is that you can actually just capture the, the subject. And since it's a let constant, it's not going to change uh, once the wrapper has been, um, has been um, initialized. So you can do it like this, capture the subject and then send values to the subject. And so what we can do after that is that we can create a wrapper. We can get the publisher. We can sync over it. We're going to get values. And so we're going to say, OK, let's print them. So the wrapper has produced this uh, value. And let's see what's going to happen. So we need to wait for three seconds. OK, wrapper 46 and then wrapper 54. OK, see. Every three seconds, we get a new value that is produced by the repeated legacy async stuff. It's being sent through uh, the subject. 
and then the pass through subject is exposed as a publisher and we are listening to it by using the sync operator like we're starting to get used to because we've used the sync operator uh, quite some times since the beginning of this training course. And so this is how you would wrap um, either a method with a handler that will be called several times or like a delegate, like typically, I don't know, um, the core location delegate that gives you the, the user's position. I don't know if it has a, a built-in combined wrapper, but if it doesn't have one and you want to, uh, to do a little exercise, you can try to wrap a core location manager so that, it, so that you expose a stream of a CL location that can be then like uh, observed by your view and maybe displayed uh, on, a, on a map, for instance. And so if I had used current value subject, uh, the code would have been the same because, I know there is one difference. There is one difference is that current value subject, you need to give it a default value. So here I'm going to give it a default value of zero, which isn't great because zero is an integer value that, uh, that makes sense. So maybe I could say minus one, for instance, but you can see that the fact, the fact that you need to provide a default value is not neutral because you might be dealing with situations where there is no actually default value that makes sense. Uh, in that case, the trick is, uh, of course, to wrap it into an optional, and then you have a default value uh, for free, which is going to be uh, nil, basically. And so the code still, uh, still builds, and the only difference is that if I look on the subject, I can get the value. So in addition to having the send uh, commands, I can also query the value. So this can be useful if, like, other parts of your code are not into, like, a... Uh, architecture into reactive streams and you need to, uh, to access the, the current value. Basically, if you need to access the current value, as the name suggests, you should use a current value subject. But if you don't need to, you can just use um, a pass-through subject. And what's important to remember is that since you can send values to the pass-through subject, you probably want to encapsulate your code so that the pass-through subject is private. And then downstream, you only expose a publisher. So typically, if you have uh, subjects in your view models, then you probably want to only expose a publisher to your view this way, like it prevents like uh, some uh, some bad architecture uh, implementation where the view would also be sending data uh, to the um, to the subject, and that would probably be something that either leads leads to a bug or leads to a to a really bad uh, a really bad code smell. Um, and last last thing I wanted to tell you is that about current value subject, but since it's all, since it both holds the current value and uh, also exposes a publisher, in a way, current value subject is very, very similar to an at published uh, property. The only difference is that it will not update your view by default like at published does, but uh, basically at published, it's, uh, it's a current value subject uh, in disguise. In this, in this case, uh, the API is just a bit different because you don't do a send, you just assign a uh, uh, a value to the variable, but the, the logic behind it is pretty much uh, the same. So that was the first part of what I wanted to show you about uh, operators. I showed you the operators, the most uh, common one, the one that you will be using at one point or another if you use combine um, in an iOS app. And now for the next part, we're going to talk about back pressure. So what is back pressure? If you remember when Combine was announced, so already four years ago, that was one of its main uh, selling points. It was mentioned especially because it's one of the things that Eric Swift uh, does not. And so what is back pressure? Back pressure, it refers to the situation where values are being produced faster than they can be uh, consumed. It's a term that comes from, um, from engineering, uh, but engineering in, uh, in general, you can imagine like uh, if you have, um, imagine that like you have a sink, uh, like a real sink in your, in your kitchen, and um, the pipe that brings in the water is larger than the pipe that takes it out, then you can be in a situation where there is more water pouring in than what can be drained from the sink. And so what's going to happen is that at some point it's going to overflow, basically. That situation is what's called back pressure in, uh, in engineering. And it can also happen in, um, in computer science. 
imagine that you have a publisher that publishes, for instance, I don't know, like uh, it takes a screenshot of the of the screen. Uh, it takes a screenshot like every second and then you process the screenshot, but it takes you two seconds to process it. Uh, you're going to be in a situation where you're going to like uh, build up a backlog of unprocessed uh, images and then you have a problem because you are building a delay, a delay and a delay and basically you are you keep processing older images, so you need to, a way to deal with this back pressure. And there are two ways to deal with back pressure in Combine. There is the way of discarding values, so you will voluntarily discard some values because you don't have time to process them. And the other approach is to buffer values, so you will collect values together in order to process them all at once, which can be useful, for instance, if you want to send the values uh, to a network call. So we're going to start from uh, from a clean from a clean slate so that we have everything um, separated. So I'm creating a new project which I call Back Pressure, still a Swift UI uh, project, still putting it on my desktop. Okay, let me give the right dimension to the window. Perfect. So just like before, I create my Swift file code. I'm going to hide this panel. I create my function run. I call it when my app starts by using the modifier on app here, like that. Okay, so let's get started. So in order to deal with back pressure, we to simulate back pressure, we need to have producers that will produce values and preferably um, a lot of them. So let's create that publisher. So I'm, I'm opening the finished project on my second screen. This way I can see how I implemented this. Yes, so here's how I implemented this. So first we start by importing combine. We also create our cancelables, so which is a set of any uh, cancelable like that. Okay, and now let's create our, um, our publisher that will be publishing lots of values. So I'm going to create a subject. This way we can build on what we've seen just before. I'm calling it pass through subject that will produce integers. This way we have a data type that is quite simple to, uh, to handle. And then I'm going to create a loop. So I'm going to iterate over 100 um, values. All right. And inside my loop, I will do dispatch queue main async after. And so I'm going to say after a deadline, which is now plus I, which I need to lift uh, as a double in order for the code to build. So basically, I will send a value after one second, after two seconds, three seconds, etc. Then I will say, OK, print new value sent because I want to know when I sent when I send the value and then I send it. So on my subject, I call send and I send the value. This way we'll be able to observe my subject and see how I can deal with the back pressure. So we are sending a number every second and we can assume that for instance, it would take us like three seconds to process a number. So we're in a situation where we need to deal with back pressure. So how can we deal with it? What are the several options that we have? I told you, you can either discard values or collect values. So first, let's deal with discarding values. And if you've used Eric Swift, you will see operators that you might have been using uh, without knowing it was actually to handle this general problem of back pressure. So the, pro the first one you can use is called throttle. So you say you want to throttle for 10 seconds on the main queue. And then you have this latest argument. Let's see what's going to happen. Um, you know what? I'm just going to format it because I want to make sure that you can see uh, everything and uh, I can very easily like uh, start to uh, hide the code. So this way I'm sure that you will see it. And then I'm going to sync. So I get my value and I'm going to print. And what do I print? I will say new value received. This way we can see the difference between when a value is sent and when it is actually received. And finally, I need to store in, 
the array of can say labels. Why don't I get access to it? Let's see, does this code build? Oh, it's because here it's called actually value. Okay, much better. So you know what, first, let me remove the throttle and let's see what's going to happen, just to make sure. I was about to launch it on iOS 17. Even though there shouldn't be any difference for combine, uh, I don't feel that bold, so I don't want to do it live. <laughs> okay, you can see, so new value sent one, received one, sent two, received two, sent three, etc., etc., etc. So it's working as expected. Now let's see what's going to happen when I throttle for 10 seconds. We can see a value is sent, one, and it's received. And then more values are being sent. And then after 10 seconds, we receive a new value. So throttle, you can really see it. It's kind of like a, a sampling uh, in a way. What it does is that when you say throttle, it's going to send the first value and then it's going to wait for a period of time before it sends a new value. So this way, you will only have uh, one value every 10 seconds at most, and other values will be discarded. And you can see there is this argument latest. So this argument is a bit weird because when you set it to true, it guarantees that the value it will send will be the last value sent during the 10 seconds um, window. So as you can see, it's indeed 52, 42, uh, 31, 21, etc. However, if I set latest to false, let's see what's going to happen. So we need to wait 10 seconds. And you can see it still sent um, 11. And if you look at the documentation, you can see that, I'm not sure if you can see it. I think it's appearing off screen. Um, let me make it so that you can see it better. It says the latest, a Boolean value that indicates whether to publish the most recent element. If false, the publisher emits the first element received during the interval. And uh, that's not always what happens. Like here, it does give you the first element received, so 22. But here, that was not the case. It was 21. So this argument latest is a bit, uh, is a bit weird. Uh, I tried to understand why it behaved that way. And to be honest, I wasn't able to find uh, an explanation that like satisfied me in the sense that uh, I felt confident I could rely on how latest works. So I would say if you use latest true, it seems to work as you would expect, but latest false is not really the case. So um, the fact that the doc says it's the first value emitted doesn't seem to be the case, so I wouldn't rely on uh, the way latest behaves when you set it to false. Um, so I wanted to point this uh, to point this out. But the more important topic here is that throttle is going to take into account the first value and then nothing for a period of time. So throttle can be very useful in um, some scenarios. Like let's imagine you want to um, to listen for the user tapping on a button. Uh, of course, you want to do an action as soon as the user taps on that button. But if the users If the user keeps tapping on that button, you don't want to do the same action uh, for every tap because the user might be tapping like uh, 10 times a second and the action might be costly. So this would be a great use case for throttle. Maybe you want to throttle for one second and this way, if the user taps, it's going to register the first tap immediately. But if the user taps again in uh, that same, uh, during the, the following second, then that second tap uh, will be ignored. So this can be an interesting UI, uh, UI trick if you have users that uh, are very like uh, enthusiastic in the way that they interact with your app and it basically like uh, breaks, your, uh, breaks your app or starts a lot of like processes that you wouldn't want to start. Sometimes it's much easier to add a throttle than to implement like uh, all of the logic to, uh, to deal with uh, resources, to, uh, to like uh, put some calls on hold. Maybe like you just don't want to allow the user to spam your, uh, to spam your UI. So throttle can be, uh, can be very useful for this. And throttle also has a similar uh, looking operator, which is the operator called debounce. You might uh, have used this one in other contexts because debouncing is something 
that is um, that is quite uh, that is quite common. Actually, the term debunks, I think it comes from uh, electrical engineering before it came from uh, computer science. And so debunks can be a bit uh, a bit weird. So let's see how it uh, behaves, and then I will explain uh, the logic behind it. So this time I'm debouncing just for two seconds, or you know what, I will put it for three seconds. So I'm debouncing for three seconds, then I'm going to sync, and I will say, okay, when I get a value, um, I want to print new value received. Let me print the value. I'm going to comment out this code this way. What's happening at the console um, will be just the, the debounce. And let me run the code. And now you can see values are being sent, but no values are being received. That's absolutely um, on purpose. It's because the way debounce works is that when a first value is sent, debounce starts a counter for three seconds. And if at the end of the three seconds, no new value has been sent, it will then send the last value it has received. However, if a new value is sent in the three seconds window, it will reset the timer to zero. And that's why no values are being received. It's because the timer is of three seconds. We have a new value being sent every second. And so there is no way that um, a three second window can uh, elapse without a new value being sent. There will be, of course, an exception to this. It will be at the end of the, of the sequence. So while I'm talking, the sequence is progressing and we will be able to see this. So debounce can be a bit confusing because this mechanism of a timer that resets can be hard to visualize, but there is a trick, and is that debounce works exactly like uh, an elevator does. When you enter an elevator, you press the floor that you want to, um, to go into, and then it starts a timer. At the end of this timer, the door of the elevator closes, but if during that time someone enters the elevator or presses a new button, in most elevators, it's going to reset the timer. And same thing, if the doors are closing and someone enters, the door reopens, but they don't close immediately. The timer before the door closing is also reset. So debounce is really uh, an elevator for your data. You're sending your data into an elevator, and then once the, the time value has elapsed, only then will the last value be able to take the elevator and be sent through the, the data stream. So I hope that metaphor helped to make things a little bit more clear. At least it did the job of uh, letting time go by because you can see that there is one value that was received. It's the last one because after the last one, there were indeed no new values for three seconds. And so we have received the value. And indeed, as you're saying, it's not an elevator, it's an LA data. It's basically that same concept. So now let's try and make the bounce a little bit more interesting. And the way to do it is to update our code so that some values will never be sent. And it took me a bit of time to find a trick to do that. But once I found it, I was pretty happy with it. I just need to add a where clause after my for. So it's just like having an if inside your, uh, inside your, uh, your for loop, except that you can write the condition of the if directly in the for loop. And the condition will be that bool.random is true. This means that there is one uh, chance out of two that we actually skip the value, that we don't send the value. And now let's see what happens. We can see, okay, a value was sent, a value was sent. Okay, one more value. And basically we need three values not to be sent for debounce uh, to fire. So the odds are not that high actually. That's why it might not uh, happen because I think with three I was enthusiastic because I need like either three or even four values. So four values, it's like, uh, you know, it's like one, uh, uh, one half, one quarter, one eighth, one sixteenth. So that's not a lot. But here we add one. It seems that we add one. And yeah, if you don't know it, we can use a for where in a for loop. It's great when you want to put an if as the first part of your uh, of your um, of your for loop. It's a great way to uh, to simplify the code. So we had one uh, example 
here. So it might seem a bit weird, but it's because since we are scheduling things using a timer, uh, a timer is not precise. It doesn't promise that it will send things like every second for real. There is a small tolerance, so that's why it might give a bit of a, a weird result. But I'm going to put the bounce to two seconds, and this way the window is smaller and it will give like uh, more opportunities for values to be sent. So here you can see, for instance, one was sent and then only five was sent like five seconds later. And so one was received because there was time enough for the window to, uh, to close, for the elevator doors to close. Same thing here for 16. And so debounce, you can use it also in typical UI case. Let's imagine that this time you have um, a, search, uh, a search field. Uh, actually, we might have used it in the, in the previous project. I'm not sure, but we might have used it. You have a search uh, field and you want your user to type a search query and then you want to make a network call to get the result of that query. But you don't want to make a new call every time your user types in a new character. What you want is for your user to have stopped typing for a certain amount of time before you make the request. And in that situation, putting a debounce of 300 milliseconds, for instance, on the search query is a great way to wait for your user to have stopped typing before sending the request. And if the, am if the amount of time of the debounce is uh, quite small, like 300 milliseconds, your user will probably not even notice that it's not actually immediate. It will still feel like it's uh, searching as you type, but you will save a lot on resources. Because imagine if your user is writing a word that is like, uh, 10 characters long, you would have fired maybe 10 uh, network requests. And with debounce, you will have fired, in the best case, only once. But even if your user stopped a bit in the middle, you will, you will have fired like only two network requests, which is al already like uh, much better than uh, firing like 10 network requests. It's going to uh, hurt the resources, uh, the battery, the battery and the, the data consumption of the device. And also it's going to make your backend deal with additional data call, which might also uh, have a cost if you need to pay for like uh, your backend to scale to the number of calls that you make to it. So we've seen Throttle and Debounce, which are the two APIs that you use when you want to um, ignore some values because with both throttle and debounce we were ignoring values. So there are cases where it's okay to ignore um, to ignore values. Uh, I'm thinking typically. Let's imagine also like for some reason you are uh, observing the scroll offset of a scroll view to send it like to an analytics service to an analytics service uh, to know like uh, if the user is scrolling around a lot. It means that maybe like they don't understand what to do with uh, with your screen. On the other hand, if you have an infinite scroll and they keep scrolling, it means that they are hooked on your app and you are like uh, maybe happy with it if you are TikTok or, uh, or Instagram. But you definitely don't want to send one analytic event for every value of the scroll offset. And in that case, it's okay to lose some values. So when it's okay to lose some values, you can discard um, some of the values by using this timing based operators, which are throttle and debounce. And now we will see the other strategy, which is to buffer values uh, together. So first, let me remove this where clause right here because we won't be needing it for now. And so I'm going to take my subject and I'm going to be using um, an operator that is called collect. So it looks like this. So I'm going to say, for instance, uh, collect with a count of five. And then I'm going to just sync. And because I'm starting to get lazy, I'm just going to copy and paste the code. Let's launch this and let's see what's going to happen. So we see values are being sent. One, two, three, four, five values have been sent. But what's been received now is an array of these five values. And same thing uh, for the next batch of five values. So collect is going to take a publisher and is going to collect, as the name suggests, its values into a buffer. And once that buffer is full, it will send it downstream. And so here the size of the buffer is of five elements. And so it's a great way when you want to collect values. When you, it's a great 
uh, API when you don't want to discard values because maybe each value has a uh, meaning in your business logic and you can't afford to discard uh, them. Otherwise, you wouldn't be doing what your user expects your app to be doing. But still, processing each value individually is uh, costly. And so in that case, you can use collect. This way you can process the values uh, together. So collect is actually quite of a smart operator because here I showed you the simple version where you just tell it, okay, I want to collect a given uh, number of, uh, of values, a fixed number of values, but there is also a version of collect which takes a strategy and there are two possible strategies by time or by time or count. So let's start by the first one, which is by time. And so I'm going to say, let's use the main queue to, uh, to count the time. And let's say, for instance, three seconds. If I run this code, what it's going to do is that it's going to collect values for three seconds, and then it's going to send them. Here, since we are sending one value every second, doing a collect of three or collect by time every three seconds is roughly the same. It might differ a bit sometimes if like uh, the, the timer doesn't publish uh, precisely on every second, but it still does roughly the same. But now, if I put back the code that skips values, as you can see, this code is definitely very handy for what I want to show you. Now, you can see that, okay, only these two values were, were sent during uh, the three seconds, so they were collected and sent. Here, same thing. Here, only one value was emitted during the three seconds, so only one value was collected. And so you can see collect um, at play in a situation where um, the, the items, are, uh, the new values are not being produced on a regular rhythm. And here we had three values in uh, the three seconds, and so three values were sent downstream. So this can be very useful, but there can still be situations where maybe like uh, you're making an API call and you cannot send more than that many values at once. And this is when you can use uh, the third, so the third operator, which is still collect, but with a strategy by time or count. And so this time I'm going to say, okay, it's still going to be the dispatch queue main and the time it will be um, let's see, what did I put into the... Okay, I had put 10 seconds and 5. And so this is the time uh, and this is the count. Uh, we lose the external name for the argument, so it's a little bit less readable. But what it says is that, if I remember it correctly, I hope I'm not saying a mistake, but we will see just after, um, it's going to collect items during uh, 10 seconds and send them at the end. But if during these 10 seconds it collects more than five items, then it will send them right away. So let's see if this indeed behaves as I have described. So we have one value. We have two values, three, four. Okay, we only had four values during the 10 seconds, so they have been sent. This time we only have one, two, three, Okay, we have we are being very lucky because we don't have any case where we have less than five values. Okay, so this, as you can see, we had five values and so they were sent immediately together. And then the 10 seconds elapsed, but there were no values sent during that time. Here, the values were sent. And what's interesting is that here we have an interesting case where you see, so here we, we reached the end of the 10 seconds. So there were a new 10 seconds that started. During these 10 seconds, we had five, val five values being sent. So they were collected and sent together. And then before the 10 seconds expired, one more value was emitted. And so it was also sent at the end of the 10 seconds. What this shows is that when um, we reach the count, the values are sent, but it doesn't reset uh, the timer. And whatever values that have been collected by the end of the timer will also be sent, even if they don't fill uh, an array of, uh, of, five, uh, of five items. 
And so same thing, this approach can be very useful if you need to send data to a, to a backend. Here, the typical use case for this would be um, an analytics framework. And on an, on an analytics framework, you're going to, um, to like uh, call a method to say like log event. But of course, you don't want to make an HTTP call every time you log an analytics event, an analytics event because during the loading of a screen, maybe you could be loading, I don't know, like three, four, five events, depending on, uh, on how you have implemented your app and you don't want to make one call for each uh, of them. So what you would want is in your analytics SDK, you would want to receive uh, the values and then have this strategy of, okay, I'm going to send all of my events uh, together at the end of one minute for instance, but if I have received more than 10 events, I'm also going to send them right away because either uh, my API will not support it if I send too many events or just many events have happened and I don't want to process them like uh, right away. This way, if the user kills the app uh, before the end of the minute, I don't lose um, these events, even though a good analytics, a good analytics SDK, SDK would also like store them uh, in uh, on disk so that they can be sent uh, later. But uh, you, you you see the uh, you see the ID. And so this is the two operators that you have uh, the two approaches that you have in combined by default to deal with back pressure, either by uh, sampling and discarding potential values or by collecting values into buffers. And um, this way, you can deal not with individual values, and there could be many of them, but you can deal with buffers of values uh, one at a time. And the buffer of values, the idea is that they will be sent uh, less often than the individual values would have been sent. And finally, for this part on back pressure, I want to show you one last thing that I think I had mentioned uh, during the the last the, the first session, which is to show you how to implement a custom subscriber. Let's imagine that you let's imagine that you need to deal with a very specific situation and the collect or debounce operator don't work for you. You really want to have control over how your operator asks for new value. You can do it by implementing a custom subscriber. Fair warning. I have never encountered a situation where I needed to do it, but I still want to show it to you because even if you don't need to use it, it's still interesting to understand how uh, subscribers are implemented under the hood in Combine because virtually most of the operators that you use, they are subscribers because it subscribes to upstream values in order to produce new values. And so understanding how they are implemented, it's still great um, in order to learn how Combine works under the hood. So let's implement this. We're going to implement a class called custom subscriber. It's going to implement the protocol subscriber. It's the first time that we are implementing this protocol by ourselves. And so let's first start and give a few type aliases. So what will be the input of this subscriber? It's going to be an integer because I want to be able to use it with uh, the publishers and with my subject, which I have created just above. What will be uh, the type of the failure? It's going to be never because I'm not dealing with failures here. And then we need to implement the methods of the protocol subscribers. So as you can see, there are three of them and I'm just gonna move them uh, right here. I'm gonna move them below um, the type aliases. This way it's going to be a bit more, uh, a bit more, a bit more clear what we are doing. And so the first method to implement is receive subscription. So this is called when we are um, basically subscribing to, uh, to our subscribers. Let's actually look at the doc because it will probably uh, describe it maybe better than I do. So if we take a look inside subscriber to see what's written. So it tells the, subscri the subscriber that it has successfully subscribed to the publisher and it may request items. So this is what happens once you have subscribed and where you can ask the publisher uh, for new items. So as you can see, we receive a subscription as an argument and this we will need to store inside the subscriber, inside our custom subscriber. So let me store an optional subscription. So I'm going to print to say, custom subscriber 
I'm sure I've made a typo. Yes, I was sure I had made a typo. So, so a subscriber subscribed like this. Then I'm going to store the subscription inside my property. And I'm going to say, okay, on this subscription, I'm going to request, you can request, you can see either non, unlimited, or max one value. I'm going to say, okay, the publisher that is upstream, I want it to send me only maximum one value for now, and then I will deal with it, and I will see if I ask for more values later. Then we have the method receive input. So this one, as the name suggests, is going to be called whenever an input has been received. So when you do a sync and you pass in a closure for receive value, in a way, it's a convenience API to get the what is sent to that method. And you can see that you need to return something, which is a demand to say, okay, now that we have, now, now that you have received this input, how many more input do you want to uh, to receive? So first, let's do a little print so that we can see at the console after what will uh, happen. So custom subscriber received, and let's log uh, the value to the console. And so what we could say is that we could say, for instance, okay, for now, I don't want any more value, but maybe a little bit later. So let's do an async after. Um, so for now, I don't want anything more, but in like uh, two seconds, I would like to ask for maximum two more values. It's um, see it just like as a purely like uh, an exercise. Uh, don't try to imagine like what kind of situation this algorithm could uh, could fit. It's more to show you like uh, how the API of subscriber uh, works. And finally, receive completion. I'm not going to do uh, anything because I have basically nothing to do here in my case. And what I could do now that I have defined my subscriber, so I'm going to just comment this code. I'm going to come, uh, so just after my class, I'm going to say subject and then subscribe my custom subscriber. And let's see what's going to happen. So you can see, subscribed. Then a value was sent and we received it. Then two values were sent, but we didn't receive them right away because we waited two seconds to say we wanted two more values. And then you can see that as time goes by, um, we get the values immediately because every time we get a new value, after two seconds, we say we want two more. And so we are going to be asking for more and more and more value. And so the number of uh, values that we accept to receive is going to grow like uh, to grow. No, I'm not sure if it's exponentially, but actually, it's, but it's going to grow like uh, a lot and up to the point where we receive every new value um, as soon as it has been produced. So this is more of an example, but it's for the rare case where you would need to have like a very like a custom strategy. Let's imagine that depending on the input, you want to ask more values or not. Like maybe there are inputs that are very easy to process. So when you receive them, you're like, okay, I can get two more. And then there are other where you know, okay, this will take a bit of time to process. So I'm going to like uh, wait a bit before I ask for a, for a new value. This could be useful because here I've just done a dispatch queue main async after, but you could imagine doing something where you process the value and once you're done processing the value, only then do you ask for more values on the, on the subscription. Uh, but to be honest, uh, as I was saying, I've never seen a situation where I had to implement this kind of, uh, of things. But it could happen like if you need to implement like a very low level st stuff, like for instance, let's imagine you're trying to implement um, an API in Combine that uh, allows you to interact with, uh, with web sockets, something fairly uh, low level. Maybe for this kind of thing, there would be situation where you would want to create a custom subscriber, but definitely only do this as a, as a last resort, because uh, as you can see, it's complex. It's error prone. Uh, it's very easy to, to screw up. So most of the time you want to use the built-in operators which have been tested and which work um, fairly well. And only if they don't allow you to, um, to do what you want, then you should use a, a custom subscriber. But uh, 
please don't do it by default. I wanted to show it to you because it's interesting to understand how a subscriber works uh, under the hood. But as I said, I've never need to, to use it. And for your typical iOS app, there is probably not that many uh, situations where you would need to implement a custom subscriber. So I'm looking at the, at the time, we spent two hours together, but since I only have a very small part left in this training course, I think I'm going to do it uh, now. This way, the second like session will probably be also the last session. Uh, that's the great thing about Combine, is that it's much easier to explain than Swift UI. There is much less concept that you need to, uh, to explain. So we're going to talk about, um, about the last part, which is how to test um, a publisher. So I'm looking into um, my uh, my script. Perfect. So how to test a publisher because I also have the finished version for it. Uh, we're still going to do it together. So we're going to create a new um, a new project. So let me just make the window the right size if I can catch it. Perfect. So let's create an app. We will call it testing publishers, and this time make sure to check the box include tests, because this time we want to have our tests. So I'm just going to put it on my desktop. So it created uh, a few tests. Uh, I can tell you I'm going to remove the UI tests because they are not interesting uh, to me. I'm only interested in the unit tests. And uh, I mean, Combine is a framework that is not linked to the UI. So the UI tests are not useful uh, to me uh, at all. Then I'm going to remove all this thing in the, in the testing publisher test that was created by default. So I'm in this file right here. And so let's try and write, uh, and write a test. So first thing you need to do when you want to write publisher, you will probably need to subscribe to it at some point. So what you want is to create a private var on your, um, on your test case that will store your set of any uh, cancelable. Remember to also import, uh, import combine. OK. Now you want to make sure that you're not carrying over one subscription from one test to the next. So what you can do is override the method setup. Be careful, don't override the class method setup because the class method setup, as you can see, Xcode generated this one by default. But this one will be called when um, the test case, when the class itself is called, whereas the instance method setup will be called before each test in the class is executed. So you don't want to make that mistake. And uh, Xcode doesn't do a great job here because by default, it creates the one that you probably don't want. So we're going to call um, to call super, and then we're going to say cancelables equals a new set. This way, we clear any potential uh, existing subscriptions from the previous test. And then let's actually try and implement a test to test my even numbers publisher. So for this, I'm actually going to need to implement some code in my uh, in my app so in my app i'm going to create a new swift file i'm going to call it code and inside i'm going to cr to create two uh, top level functions so first i import combine so the first one will be called even numbers publisher is going to return some publisher of int and never okay and as you can imagine, it's going to be 2, 4, uh, 6, 8, and 10. This time, I'm putting the 6. And the same logic, but for an odd numbers publisher. And so different values. This time, it's going to be 1, 3, 5, 7, and 9, like that. So I have these things I can test inside my testing code now. And so I'm going to want to test that all the numbers that my even numbers publisher outputs are indeed even. Um, yes, I covered uh, custom subscribers, not custom publishers, but I covered custom subscribers. But uh, don't worry, you will have the, the replay just after and you will be able to, uh, to catch up. So how do I test this? 
what I'm going to do is first create an array where I can collect the values. Something like that. And then I'm going to create what Xcode and XCTSKs calls an expectation. So expectation is the API from XCTest to test asynchronous code. If you've never used it, um, you're going to see it's quite easy to, to use. You create an expectation and you give it a name. So it's going to be even number publisher has finished, like that. Then I'm going to also have my even numbers publisher. Sometimes this is what's called the system under test with the acronym SUT and it's going to be my even numbers publisher. And so what I'm going to do is that I'm going to sync to it and I will give it two closures. So in the receive completion, once the publisher has finished, I'm going to say expectation dot fulfill. And then for the receive value, I will get the value and I will just append it to the array like that. I need to store my subscription somewhere. So I store it in the set of any cancelables that I had created previously. And now you see what I want to do is that I want to do an XCT assert. I want to assert that all the elements in my, val in my array values satisfy the predicate that the element is a multiple of two. I want to test that they are indeed even numbers, that I'm not being lied to, that I will only receive even numbers. The problem is that I need to wait for the values to have been outputted before I run this line. And so this is where the expectation comes into play. We're going to use it as a barrier. So what we're going to do is that here we're going to say wait for expectations and give it a timeout of 10 seconds. And what this does is that it's going to wait for any expectation, expectation, expectation that we have created to complete. And if after 10 seconds, the expectations haven't completed, then exit test case, exit test is going to consider that the test has failed. What can be a bit weird is that we don't mention the expectation here. And it's because as you can see, we create the expectation by calling a method on self. And so the instance of exit test case is keeping track of which expectation have been created. That's why we don't need to pass in the array of expectations here when we are implementing the barrier. So here we put the barrier down uh, to wait. And here when we call fulfill, we lift, we lift the barrier. So if you've ever used like uh, semaphores uh, and, bar and locks with semaphores, uh, this is basically a, a lock. This is basically what we have implemented. And so now let's run this code. And let's see if it works. I'm running my test on iOS 17. I'm being a bit adventurous, but uh, normally it should work. There is no reason for it not to work. I'm just going to move the simulator uh, out of the way. So it's testing. When I record a video, this is the kind of part that I cut because it usually takes a bit of time for the test to launch for the first time. I'm regretting my choice of not using the iOS 16 device. You know what? I'm just going to kill it. I'm going to quit uh, that iOS 17 simulator and just relaunch the simulator that is already open. Uh, okay. Uh, that's my previous expert project, not the one I want. Not the one I want also. I want this one. Okay. Let's see. But normally what should happen is that the test should succeed. And then I'm going to go back into the file, put an odd number into it. Into Okay, so we can see the test has indeed succeeded. But of course, if we cannot make the test fail, uh, we don't know that the test is actually testing something correctly. So let's put an odd number into this publisher and let's see what's going to happen. 
you can see that this time the test has failed. So that's uh, what you can use when you want to test a publisher uh, in Exitest. You can use an expectation. You can notice that um, we could have also done something different. We could have said values equal system under test dot collect because collect, we have this version which collects all received elements and emits a single array when the upstream publisher finishes. This would work, but the problem is that if the upstream publisher never finishes, there is no timeout. So for a test, it's not that great because then your test would run forever. And uh, on a CI, you don't want the test to run forever. Potentially, you want your test to fail because you don't want to have your CI being blocked uh, forever. So it's better to use the expectation. What's kind of annoying is that we have to write a bit of boilerplate code. So before we write the test for the odd numbers publisher, let's try and refactor this so that we can have um, a way to await the result of a publisher. So the code I'm going to show you, uh, I took the ID from an article from, uh, from the website of, uh, of John Sandel because it's a, great, um, it's a great strategy and also it allows me to show you how to create so we will see if there is a way to, co to collect. Uh, you know what? While I do this, you can look to see because there is a great question. Isn't there a way to collect publisher values with async await? Um, I think there is a way because you can get an async sequence from a publisher. Uh, you can call values. So that's, uh, that's a great question. Let's have a look very quickly. So we can call values and values is an async publisher but it's the kind of, it's an async sequence. So you do a for await in on it. So you don't await for the, uh, for the array. So in that case, I'm not sure that it, uh, that it is what you want. But if you want to look if there is a way in uh, the Apple API to use async await to await for the result of collect and also with a timeout, uh, that would be very interesting. And uh, during that time, I will... Uh, I will show the other solution, which is to implement an extension to XC test case. So XC test case, it's the, um, the super class of all of your test cases in, um, in the test in your unit tests. And what's interesting is that I can, uh, it, it allows me to show you also how to create an extension uh, to XC test case, which is something that uh, is quite straightforward. It's quite straightforward like uh, conceptually, but there are a few things that you want to be, uh, to be aware of. So we will call this method await publisher. Why is it a method? Because we saw that uh, to create an expectation, you need to call uh, an instance method. So this method, this needs to also be an instance method because you want to be able to call an instance method inside of it. So await publisher. We're going to have a generic argument, which will be a publisher because we want to be able to use this with any kind of publishers. And so we will take as a first uh, argument a publisher. Actually, you know what? I'm just going to call it a wait like that and publisher like this. So publisher of type T. Uh, maybe I will rename, rename it like P. This way it's a little bit uh, clearer. Then I want to have my uh, timeout, which will be a time interval. And what's great here is to give it a default value because most of the time in your test, you're okay with the default value. And if you know that something can take longer, you can give a longer value. If you know that it should complete in two seconds and if it hasn't in two seconds, it's no point waiting. You can also give a shorter value, but uh, a default value here is definitely very useful. And then you're going to need to keep track of, uh, of two more things, uh, but I'm not sure what I... Actually, I'm not sure I use them. You know what? Maybe I don't need them. So maybe I can just keep moving like this. So then this is going to uh, throw. What's interesting is that inside uh, a test, you can throw an error and it will automatically fail the test. So it's a great feature that you can, uh, that you can, uh, that you can use. So let's try it. So I'm making it froze and I want to return an array which will be of type p dot output. So if my publisher publishes integers, then I want to return an array of integers. It's the strategy of like collecting the, collecting the values. Now we just need to implement the body of the function. It will be very similar to what we had just above. So we're going to need an array 
to be able to collect the values into. So an array of p dot output that I start with an empty array. We're gonna have uh, to store a reported error. So if an error has been reported by the publisher, because we want to deal with the general case where the publisher can return an error. So let's store an error optional because an error might not happen. Then let's create the expectation. So it's going to be self dot expectation and describe it by saying awaiting publisher, something like that. Here, what could be useful um, would be because this will not be very describing, which is to here add a hidden argument. I mean, an argument with a default value, which we call like method. And we give it a default value of hashtag. Um, I think it's hashtag function actually. So it's the name of the function. This will give as a default value for the method await, the name of the function in which await has been called. So if you ever wonder like how like uh, logging libraries, they're able to know in which uh, file, line, colon, uh, your code was called. That's what they do. They use either hashtag function, but you also have hashtag line, hashtag uh, column, and also hashtag file, for instance. Uh, these, are the, these are macros uh, that Swift supports for, uh, for quite a long time, and they are super useful. This way, you could say awaiting publisher in test, and then pass in the, it would be here, so it would be test name. This way, you can collect the name of the test. And if the expectation doesn't uh, fulfill, it will be easier to understand what went wrong in the logs. All right. Once we have this, we can also uh, store actually a cancelable and we can store it in a local variable because since we are awaiting for the publisher to complete, there is no need um, to store the cancelable outside of the body of the of the of the method because we know that we won't have returned before the expectation has either fulfilled or timed out. So let's store it. And what we will do is that we will take the publisher we took as an argument. We're going to sync over it. And we're going to say, okay, so when we receive a completion, we switch on the completion. If it's a failure and we have an error, then we're going to store it into the reported error. If it's just finished, so it finished successfully, we are just going to break. And then regardless, we're going to fulfill the expectation because it means that uh, it has finished either with an error or without an error. And when we receive a value, we do what we were doing before. So we take the array of values and we append the new value to it like that. I'm going to add an extra uh, return line here. Okay. And then what do we have to do? We have to wait for the expectations with the timeout that has been provided as an argument. Then we're going to cancel the cancelable in case there was something uh, being executed. We can cancel it. To be honest, uh, this, could be, um, this could be omitted because anyway, when the function returns, any cancelable will be deallocated. So here we are doing it manually ex instead of it being done automatically a few lines after. Uh, the difference in performance is probably negligible, but uh, still writing it so that the code is as correct as it can be. And then we say, okay, if let reported error, then we're going to throw the error and we are allowed to do this because our function throws. And finally, if we've reached that point, it means that the expectation was fulfilled. There, was, there were no error. And so we can return the values that we have collected. And so we have our function await here and we can use it in a new test case. So we're going to say test odd numbers publisher like that. And what we're going to do this time is going to be much simpler because we're going to say, okay, my system under test is my odd numbers publisher. What are the values provided by it? I just need to do try await 
my publisher, which is going to be odd numbers publisher, I need to make my test froze so that if an error is thrown here, it will automatically be thrown by the method, so by the test, and the test will fail. It's similar to if I had, um, I mean, I could have not put this froze and just do a do, try, catch, and in catch, uh, do an XCT, uh, XCT fail, but uh, you can just do a froze, it does the same thing, and it's much more um, convenient. Okay, I'm wondering if the word await, I think because it's not happy about the word await, I think I shouldn't have called it await. So I think originally it was called await publisher and there was a reason uh, for it. So we'll call it await publisher, uh, allow to um, not give a name to the first argument and this way I can call it await publisher. So like that. And actually here I want to pass my system uh, under test. This time build succeed, and so I can do my assert because otherwise my test is just pointless. And I'm going to say values dot all satisfy, and so my predicate is that dollar zero is multiple of q is false, like that. Okay, let's run the test. Let's see what happens. Normally it should be working. We can see that it's working, and if I put a malicious um, even values and I relaunch all the tests, we can see first one is still good, but second one uh, is bad. So let me remove the value so that the test can all go back to green. Okay, all green, now we're good. So I see uh, a remark in the chat. So Prasamesh, you are saying, I think you can just mark the test as async and await values and call all satisfy on it and you won't need to wait for expectations. That's a great point. That's a great point. Um, I could indeed also like, um, I could make this function await publisher in a way that works with async await. And uh, indeed, even if you don't use async await in your app and you use combine, there is nothing preventing you from using async await inside your test. So that's a, that's a great remark. Uh, you could definitely use it. And I think it would be a good, uh, a good strategy. Uh, as I was saying, I found this approach in, um, in a blog article from John Sandel, and it's very likely that uh, he wrote it before Async Await was released uh, into Swift, because Combine was released into Swift uh, one year before, uh, before Async Await. And so that's the gist of how you test um, the values returned by a publisher. The strategy is that you wait for the values to be returned using an expectation in, uh, in your test, and then you do whatever you need to do on, uh, on these values, because at that point, once you have the values, uh, you no longer have any kind of um, adherence to, um, to combine. You're just dealing with, uh, with regular values. And honestly, um, I think we have reached the end of the, of the training course. There were not that many things I wanted to, um, to show you additionally. Um, last thing, I'm going to show it uh, quite, um, quite quickly. So let me put a function run here so that I can show it. And uh, let me also do an on appear here on the view that calls run. It's the fact that, um, so you can use uh, publishers with async, uh, async await. So I was saying when you have a publisher, you can call values on it and it returns an async publisher which conforms to async sequence. And so you can do a for await number in these values. And so inside, then you can print uh, the value to the console. So actually, I call it number here. So let me run this code. And because it's, uh, it's async, uh, I need to put it in a task, for instance. And you can see the values have indeed been printed to the console. 
What's nice is that this also allows you, um, so if you're using mostly async await in your code and uh, at some point you need to deal with a bit of combine, you can use this approach. And it also allows you to use async algorithms with combined publishers. If for some reason you prefer async algorithms, uh, it allows you basically to bridge, it's a bridge, these dot values, it's a bridge from the combined world uh, to the um, to the Swift concurrency uh, world. And it's quite... Uh, it's quite easy to um, to use, even though I would say, like, don't build your architecture on it because if you're using it in one or two places, it's nice and it's what it's meant for. But uh, you should use like uh, either like uh, Swift concurrency or combine, but mixing the the two uh, in equal proportions in a, an app might not be the the best case. Of course, this is always a, a case by case um, situation. But uh, what I mean to say is that. If you find yourself in uh, working in a code base where using you are, you are using sometimes concurrency, sometimes combine, you're not sure why you're making these choices. Uh, maybe you want to um, ask yourself some questions and make sure that you are indeed using the the right tool um, for the job. Uh, so you want to be careful uh, about that. Um, let me see. Uh, I see a few messages in the chat. So you're saying also there's also test scheduler from point three that gives you more advanced timing control over publisher. So that's um, that's a good point. Um, one of the big advantages of um, of Eric Swift is that you had a strong control over the, over the time. Uh, the, you could inject a timeline basically to say, okay, I want this value to be produced, then that value, and this way, when testing, it was very uh, valuable. And uh, what you're saying, I think that indeed uh, people, at, people at point three they they implemented something that allows you to um, to kind of like uh, get that same level of uh, of control. But to be honest, I haven't used it um, that uh, that much. The this thing from point three, I haven't used it that much. Um, okay, I think we are reaching the end of uh, this uh, live stream and probably also of the of this uh, of this training course. I was planning for it to be uh, around five hours, and in the end, it would uh, it would have been like uh, around like four and a half hours, which I think for combine is. Uh, is pretty uh, is pretty decent. That's one of the nice things about combine is that you, when you want to get started, it's quite uh, it's quite easy. You can see you can get started in basically like half a day uh, or like four to five hours, and uh, that's uh, that's pretty cool because if at some point you feel like um, you would like to know about combine but uh, you don't have a lot of time, it's a topic that you can pick up quite uh, quite easily. So like uh, you know you have an interview coming and they care a bit about combine, so you want to know uh, about it. In a few hours, you can pick up on it. So, following this training course, if you want to like consolidate your learning, what I would recommend is uh, go look uh, for a few like uh, blog articles on Combine. And uh, just if you if you see that you understand everything, that will give you like confidence that you have understood all the uh, important uh, important things. Um, if you want to go further, I think I mentioned it last time, but Donny Valls has written a book called uh, Practical Combine, which I haven't read, but uh, from what I have heard and um, knowing what Donny usually does, uh, I have uh, like uh, no reason not to believe that uh, the content is, uh, is great. And finally, practice makes perfect. So um, if you want to consolidate your knowledge, try to build maybe like a, a small a small app or try to uh, to imagine some like um, asynchronous problems that uh, I haven't shown you in uh, in this training course and try to think about uh, which operators you would need to use in order to uh, to solve them. Remember that operators they can be chained, they can be combined to uh, together. So sometimes the solution will not be a single operator, but maybe a combination of more than um, than one operator. But uh, besides that, I think I've told you everything I wanted to tell you. I see uh, people saying that this was informative, so thank you. I'm glad to hear that you've enjoyed this uh, this training course. I have more content planned for the for the following weeks, so the rest of the summer uh, should be rich with uh, with content. So stay tuned. I will uh, announce uh, what I will do next in the in the coming days. But uh, before I end, as always, I have a big thank you to the people who have 
have watched the, the live and commented in the chat, asked questions. It made it feel very interactive for me. And I'm sure that uh, all the people watching the replay have also enjoyed having this question being voiced so that I could uh, enjoy them. And last thing I said in the beginning, if you have enjoyed this training course, there is a link in the description. So it redirects to a, a page on Gumroad where you can buy the content for uh, whatever price you want, like $1 is the minimum price. You get the same content than uh, on YouTube, so the videos and the code. You just have a, a download all button that is uh, easy, to, uh, easy to click and it's basically a tipping jar. So if you've enjoyed the course and you want to leave, uh, to leave me a small tip, you can do it. It's of course entirely, uh, entirely optional. And I think I just have to say, yeah, one last time, uh, thank you for watching. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you've learned something. I hope that it will help you in your uh, professional iOS journey. And uh, see you next time for uh, another content. Bye-bye.